doors, doors are closed. I don't know, folks, we all trapped in here for the next 25, 30 -ish minutes. Trying to be, oh, try to be quick. I don't want to hold or stay in between all of you and Friday drinks. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you all for coming for the, I guess, the last talk of the day uh, and the last talk of this KubeCon on Friday, Friday night almost. And today we're going to talk about uh, spiffy deployments in non-Kubernetes environments. I know that's probably when it talk, when it comes to spiffy, most most of you think about it as a something for Kubernetes, but spiffy is a standard built for basically beyond that and be able to be interoperable whether you're running on Kubernetes or I don't know. Uh, Linux, VMs, your Windows bare metal, Mac OS, serverless, etc. So today we're going to talk about like what it means and how to how to reason about spiffing on Kubernetes environment. I'll start with a quick introductions. Hi, um, I'm Nadine. I'm a software engineer at Spiral, where uh, we build an implementation of the spiffy spec, um, and I've been there for around a year now. Um, before that, I worked um, uh, in security and then in, as a systems engineer at Cloudflare. Um, and outside of work, I like to go on runs, um, hike, and travel. Awesome. My name is Eli Nesterf, and um, I think 70% maybe of people <laughs> here in person know me. But for those who are not, I'm co-founder and CTO at Spiral. I used to run and I built the world's largest deployment of spiffy open source implementation known as Spire in the past. Uh, I'm also a co-author of the book called Solving the Bottom Turtle. If you go to spiffy.io slash book, it's a free PDF book that I highly recommend everyone to read if you want to kind of get deep into topics of identity, workload identity, authentication, all this stuff. And uh, yeah, at uh, Spiral, we build in a commercial workload identity implementation. So I do not certainly expect everyone who came to this talk know what Spiffy is. So I'll, I'll do a quick recap of what is that, why we need it, how it works on a high level, and then we kind of dive in. Nadine will dive in into all the kind of interesting details. Uh, so what is Spiffy? Raise your hand if you don't know what Spiffy is. All right, perfect. We have a few people. So Spiffy stands for Secure Production Identity Framework for Everyone. Uh, it is CNCF graduated project for three plus years, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, it started on the shoulders of like how production, secure production infrastructure built in a company is like Facebook, Google, Netflix, and others, and incorporates kind of trying to generalize all this experience and how you start with like really strong cryptographic identity and how you build all your systems on top of that. So it's a specification, open specification, you can find it. Uh, in their GitHub. It's pretty nice Sunday read. Uh, so in more details, what is that, right? So specification describes multiple, multiple parts, like what is a Spiffy ID and uh, what, is, what do you do with that? So Spiffy ID is something, then I'll go into detail, something that goes what, into what we call Spiffy verifiable identity document. And uh, standard describes other, other parts, but the biggest, the biggest thing is like how your workload can go from nothing to having a sense of identity, right? And what is, a, what is the standard of this identity? How this identity can be proved to other software services through authentication? Um, 
what is the mechanism of a federation and this, there is a part of the specification that's like describe how two different trust domains and spiffy trust domains is another part of the specification how they can be federated with each other right uh, so let's dive in so what is a spiffy idea right you can think about it as a basically a uri stream containing few parts the uri the trust domain and a path part. A trust domain, pretty familiar, probably like any other domain name. And uh, a path is a very interesting component. So it could be as simple as on kind of that example, my service foo or bar. But you can structure a path in a way that basically follows your uh, organizational principles, right? It could be you can structure it in different departments or it can be closer to how do you run like, I don't know, your applications in the different geo locations like contains information, oh, is it running in EU region or it's running in US because this is something that your organization may care about. Um, so you can structure it. Uh, you probably see some familiarity things and familiar things there, especially if you used to run or yeah, you run Istio, right? So where it used a namespace and a service account principle. So what do we do with this string? The string goes into what's called a Spiffy verifiable identity document. And in this sense, Spiffy is not kind of net new standard. I mentioned that it's built on shoulders of what is exist in there, it's X509 and JWT. So this string, Spiffy ID goes inside the X509 and JWT document. And therefore anyone can verify it and you can trust the information that inside it. Uh, what it gives you is that you can use this information like Spiffy ID for your authorization systems and use authorization decisions based, based on it because you, you can trust this information. Uh, how do you verify it based on a trust bundle? And a trust bundle is basically a set of uh, public keys that's used to sign, that's used to verify the spiffy identities. And now as uh, we get into the more interesting parts, it's like, okay, here's a workload, how it's get an identity. And it's done through what's called a workload API. It is a not local Unix domain socket. Uh, the prod above, it's a gRPC service. The prod above definition is a part of a standard. Uh, so any implementation that's claimed to be SPIFI compatible, like your workloads will work with them in the same way. What I describe is how workload get identity and in which format and how to get a trust bundle. In a spiffy world or in a spiffy view of the world, there is no like workload doesn't have a say like what what should go into identity. Identity assigned to workload. The only thing that workload can do is to request identity in one or another format. So, uh, and now it's kind of interesting part of, so the, the attestation is not like really part of a standard. It's up to SPIF implementation to do this in one or another way. So here is like we're describing how the open source implementation like Spire, for instance, doing um, do the attestation of a workload. So, Spiffy agent exposes uh, workload API. As I mentioned, it's a Unix domain socket. So all the workloads on that node will go to that socket. And after that, agent can learn the process ID of the requester. So with this information, agent can go and basically interrogate different systems to learn more about the software process. So what, what agent can do is to go and ask uh, Linux kernel and learn information about uh, the process from it, right? So it's like uh, which path it's running, under which user or under which uh, group. 
or that process might be something that's running inside a Docker container and it might be running inside a Kubernetes. So agent can go and ask like a Docker daemon and Kubernetes API like, hey, what do you know about this process, right? And, and basically learn all the primitives like from Kubernetes, like the whole specification of a pod. So all this information can be used by an implementation to provide an identity, right? But again, it's like how, how it is done, it's up to concrete an implementation. So with that kind of very quick and basic introduction into the OSP, I will pass it to Nadine to continue. Thanks, Eli. Um, yeah, so as Eli kind of like now introduced the concepts of um, Spiffy, and I'm going to talk more about what um, using Spiffy in the real world looks like and what um, different deployments look like. Um, so just I want to do like a quick show of hands. How many people have deployed Spiffy in Kubernetes before? Okay. And now how many people have deployed it in Linux? Okay, so not, not as many as Kubernetes. Um, and so that's kind of like why I wanted to do this talk is because I realized that um, Spiffy, as we said, is meant to be for everyone. And that's because the idea of Spiffy is that with a single system, you can give identities to any of your workloads, regardless of where they're running and what platform um, they're running on. Um, but most of the uh, focus has been on Spiffy deployments in Kubernetes. And so this talk is going to focus more on deployments in uh, all different flavors of Linux and how those differ from, from Kubernetes. Um, before we get started with um, Kubernetes, I want to, I mean, with Linux, I want to first um, explain what a Kubernetes deployment looks like for Spiffy. Um, so you have um, a workload, which I have here in green, um, and you want to give it an identity. So typically, um, you want to deploy what's called, what we're going to call a Spiffy agent on the same node um, as the workload that you want to give an identity to. And that's because, um, for, as uh, Eli mentioned, the workload API, um, that uses um, a Unix domain socket. And so the workload is going to reach out to the Spiffy agent over that um, Unix domain socket. And then the uh, agent is going to do attestation of the workload. Um, and it typically does that in Kubernetes by talking to the kubelet. So the point here is that you want to um, have one agent run in every single uh, node that you have in Kubernetes. And so to do that, in Kubernetes, you typically run this agent as a daemon set. And that will ensure that you get um, one of these agents on every single node. Um, that's a uh, Kubernetes primitive that, that will do that for you. Um, and once you deploy this uh, Spiffy agent, then um, just like anything in Kubernetes, they all get configured um, with the same type of configuration that they pull from the Kubernetes API server. Um, I guess one final thing I want to talk about here is that um, your Spiffy agent does attestation by talking to the kubelet. And in order to talk to the kubelet, your Spiffy agent needs um, access, uh, special permissions uh, to do that. So um, there's a couple of features that I've mentioned here um, that you need when you are trying to deploy this Spiffy agent. Um, and so in, in Kubernetes, you have a lot of built-in primitives that make it very easy to run this Spiffy agent. So the first one um, is just like installing the binary on every uh, node, uh, the agent binary. Because this is running in Kubernetes, everything runs as a container image. So you don't need to think about um, the underlying architecture of your nodes and how to package your agent. You just have a container image and it runs across all of your nodes. Um, the second part, as I mentioned, with a daemon set, you get an agent in every single um, node in your Kubernetes cluster. They're all configured in the same way. And the other thing that you get here is that if your uh, agent crashes for some reason, um, with a daemon set, Kubernetes will automatically restart that for you. Um, and then the final thing there is just, um, as, we, as I said before, your agent needs um, to do attestation. And in order to do that, it needs privileged access. And in Kubernetes, you can do that with the security context. Um, you just set security context to privilege. Um, so that's Kubernetes. Now let's talk about how we get those same features in Linux. And you're going to see that um, it gets a little bit more complex. 
and you need a couple of more systems uh, to get all of these features. So here's an example um, deployment in Linux where we have two VMs um, and they each have uh, a workload on there that you want to give an identity to. Now imagine that um, these two VMs have two different uh, flavors of Linux. Maybe one is Debian and the other one is uh, Red Hat. Well, you're, you're going to need to think about how to install your Spiffy agent on there and how to package it so that you can distribute it to all of your nodes. So in, in this example, you would need to package your Spiffy agent uh, probably as a Debian package and then also as an RPM package. That's thing number one you gotta figure out. Uh, thing number two is you now have your Spiffy agent uh, packaged, but you want it to run on every one of your nodes. Uh, so in Linux, that requires some sort of configuration management. Um, configuration management is something that allows you to say what the state of the VM um, you want, and then it will um, ensure that that state uh, exists. You, if you've ever used something like Ansible, Chef, Puppet, um, SaltStack, these are all examples of configuration management software. Um, the other thing you need is probably some sort of like file that configures the agent. Um, this can also uh, be distributed to all of your nodes using your configuration management software. Um, and then if your agent crashes, um, your con configuration management software isn't going to uh, fix that for you. It won't actually restart it. So you need something like systemd to restart um, your agent. And the final piece here is for attestation in Linux, um, your agent typically talks to the kernel. Um, and to make the correct um, sysadmin calls that, that are necessary there, um, you uh, need your agent to either run as root or to run uh, with Linux capabilities. Um, and Linux capabilities, basically they allow you to run um, your agent as a different user and then you can just give certain permissions to that user um, that, are, that are sort of like higher privileged um, actions that it can do. Um, all right, so this kind of summarizes what I've talked about before. Um, but as you can see in Kubernetes, you have a lot of these inbuilt things like a daemon set, um, container images, and um, the security context that make it very easy to run your agent. And in Linux, um, you'll have to use a couple other uh, things here like um, figuring out how to package your binary, um, configuration management, um, systemd, and then thinking about um, Linux capabilities or running your agent as root. All right, um, so I've sort of talked about the um, agent so far. Um, now I kind of want to focus more on workloads and what it looks like when you have workloads um, in Linux versus Kubernetes. Um, so in, like I mentioned before, um, your attestation in Kubernetes is done um, by talking to, by the agent talking to the kubelet and um, learning something about the workload so that it can give it an identity. Um, these are some of the things that the agent can learn um, from the kubelet about the, about the workload. It can learn um, the pod name of the workload. It can learn um, any of the labels. It can learn what namespace it's running in, um, the cluster name, and also the node name. So a lot of these are all concepts that come built in with Kubernetes that are sort of like the structure that Kubernetes has in place in order to run your workloads. Um, in the case of Linux, um, you do attestation in the kernel and the kinds of um, identifiers that you can uh, learn about a, a workload are gonna be um, the host name of the VM where your workload is running, um, the Linux user and group, uh, the and then the binary path, uh, the complete binary path or the hash of the binary. And so now that you've seen these identifiers, I wanna show how uh, you can use them to build different spiffy IDs that you can give your workloads. Um, so here's an example with Kubernetes. I have um, this deployment in one Kubernetes cluster uh, with two different nodes. Um, and then uh, everything is running in the same namespace, um, but I have three workloads uh, one web server and then two databases which are replicas of each other, but the replicas are running on two different nodes. Um, so I can now use the Kubernetes identifiers to give these workloads different identities uh, based on the types of authorization policies that I wanna write on top of my Spiffy IDs. 
So we'll come back to that in a second. Um, but for now, let's look at like different spiffy IDs that you can um, build here. So if you, um, for example, include just the, um, the, the node name in your spiffy ID, then you're going to give um, both the web server and the first replica of the database um, the same spiffy ID. Um, and then they would have spiffy ID like spiffy, trust domain, and then VM123. Uh, and the other replica would have the spiffy ID um, spiffy, trust domain, VM456. Um, if you wanted to give each of these pods their own uh, spiffy ID, then you can include the pod name in your spiffy ID, and that's the second example that I have there. And then each of those would get a different uh, spiffy ID. And then imagine that instead you want to give the two uh, databases the same spiffy ID and the server um, a different spiffy ID. You can use something like the label name, and in this case, um, both databases are labeled with uh, database. Um, and finally, if you wanted to give all of these workloads the same identity, then you could um, just include the cluster name and the, na and the namespace in your spiffy ID, and then they would all have the same um, spiffy ID. Um, so you can now see how you can play around with those identifiers when you're choosing uh, what spiffy ID to give them, and then um, you're, you're, you will build authorization policies on top of those spiffy IDs um, that maybe say, like, um, the databases can, like, talk to each other, but the web server um, can only talk to the databases in certain situations. Um, now let's talk about um, Linux identifiers. So uh, here's another example where uh, we have two workloads running in Linux. They're both running uh, Python scripts, but the first one runs uh, a Python server, and the other one runs a Python client. Um, both workloads are running in the same VM, in the same Linux user and Linux group. Um, and so if you notice here, there's no way for us to give both uh, these two workloads a different spiffy ID because all of the Linux identifiers are the same. And remember, like your identifiers have to be things that can be attested. So it's not possible to um, make the name of the Python script um, as part of the identifiers, because there's no way to attest that with the kernel. Um, so I want to give you a couple solutions for how you can fix um, this kind of thing. So one way you could do this, um, if you wanted to give them different identities, is you can run these workloads as two different um, Linux users. Um, and then you can use the Linux user in your spiffy ID, and they have um, different spiffy IDs. Or the other option is you can continue to run your workloads as in the same uh, Linux user or group, but you can use another uh, platform attribute, like in this case, we're using systemd. Um, and systemd, uh, there's also a way to uh, attest um, your workloads using systemd. And so you can use the uh, unit, uh, the service name of your systemd unit in the spiffy ID to get two different identities. Um, so kind of the point I want to drive home here is that in Kubernetes, um, you have a lot of structure that makes it easy to play, to play around with the um, identifiers and get whatever spiffy ID you want. But in Linux, um, you have to actually think about how you're going to deploy your workloads. And depending on those decisions that you make, that's the kind of like identities that you'll be able to create. All right, um, so we've been sort of dancing around this question of how do you choose um, a spiffy ID? And I think overall, like the guiding principle here should be that your spiffy IDs um, should guide whatever authorization uh, policies you're going to build. Um, but I want to give you a little bit of a more um, precise answer to that. So I'll give you some examples um, of how you can think about your spiffy IDs. Um, so the first option is that your spiffy IDs can replicate your organizational structure. So say, for example, um, you, you give each service um, its own Kubernetes namespace. Then um, you can put your Kubernetes namespace in your spiffy ID and then um, decide which services can talk to other services. Or if um, you are a platform engineer and you give each um, application team in your company um, a VM where they can run all of their workloads or you give them a systemd unit, then you can include those in your spiffy ID. And in that case, um, your spiffy ID is sort of 
mimicking whatever organizational structure you have in your company. Um, the other option here is that you can actually um, think of your spiffy IDs as defining security boundaries. So as an example, if you have um, the two workloads in Linux like we had before in the example, and they have the same Linux user and Linux group, then um, they have the same permissions um, in Linux, and therefore from a Linux point of view, they have the same security posture, and therefore you can give them the same spiffy IDs. So in this case, your spiffy IDs are replicating uh, security boundaries of the platform that you're running in. So again, you, you, must, you have to think about your use case and, and what makes sense for you, but these are just two examples of what you can do. Um, and that's everything for now. Um, we have some additional resources here. If you want to learn more about Spiffy, um, check out the Spiffy website. Um, Spiffy.io slash book is um, the book that Eli um, co-wrote that he mentioned at the beginning that goes um, in depth into um, zero trust networks. Um, so check that out as well. Also, if you want to learn more about how to construct Spiffy IDs, um, we have a blog post about that on the Spiral website. And finally, um, check out our new Spiral website that we just came out with this week. Um, and if you want to give us feedback on this session, that's the QR code to do so. Thanks, everyone. We'll Thank you so much. <laughs> any, any questions, folks? Yes. Uh, so the question is how you can propagate down information that extracted from so you workload attributes. Yeah, I think I, yeah, I think if I understand your question correctly, there's lots of kind of different concepts we're talking about. It's like you're talking about the request, the workload itself, and workload characteristics. So it's like how you tie these things together. Uh, so the, the first of all, there is nothing that we can like tie to request. I think Spiffy is not focusing on the, it's like how do you use so it provides you an identity like JWG token, but there is nothing that Spiffy dictates you, oh, you should only use this token in this header, for instance, right? Um, Spiffy does not enforce, like in case of X509, how do you establish an MTLS in this case? Um, so that's, a, that's about the request, but tighten like your information that goes into Spiffy ID with the characteristics of the workloads. Uh, there is different ways, like the Nadine shows that you can do kind of one-to-one -one mapping when you know that's okay, the workload is running under the Linux user foo in a group bar, uh, we'll get a spiffy ID or have a pass like bar foo. Does it, does it make sense? Okay, thank you. Yes. Uh, Folks, if you want to ask, maybe it's like using the mic, otherwise I can try to repeat, but I think there's some echo yeah, or something. Hi, <laughs> <you. laughs> right, go ahead. On the right side. Sure. Uh, do you guys have any reference architecture for doing node attestation for on-premise workloads? Uh, yeah, it doesn't, like, the node attestation can be done in a different ways, like, the open source implementation that's called Spire has its own view, how the agent attestation can be done. We have our own implementation that has its own specific how, how, how it can be done. I recommend to just check out the book. There is a lot of kind of 
uh, how you can do an ID station and open source implementation has a different set of plugin that can be used on prem or in a cloud environment. Uh, you, the easiest thing you can do is like one time join token, basically that will work everywhere. Thank you. And that's it. Yeah, hey guys. Um, so I, I kind of sense that the Linux based workload attestations are, are pretty limited, right? Uh, far fewer attributes and looking at the constructs I think the closest thing that can get you to what like Kubernetes would offer in terms of like application identity mm -hmm. is like the system D unit. So I, I think my question is, um, is, is there ways or are there extension capabilities to say, hey, you know, here's some additional information to use for the workload attestation or is it just those four or five attributes and that's it? Uh yeah, so it, it depends on what type of kind of interrogation you're doing, like the Linux versus systemd will give you, deliver your uh, some information, but there is nothing like, I don't know, pod specification where you can use like, I don't know, labels and you put additional information into labels. Uh, some of the things you can do combination of, like let's say, not ID station ver with workload ID station and some of this information can come from like let's say if you use uh, cloud service environments and you use instance metadata for like an agent ID station right so in this case you can put information into like I don't know some tags that you put on instances um, so this is a little bit like depending on what information is important and like in case of like, let's say CI CD systems, you can leverage like J, the JWT tokens that the jobs has. Yeah, so there's uh, just one more thing. There's also um, a Docker a tester in the open source implementation. So that's, this. again, it kind of depends on the way that you're um, deploying your workloads, what kind of attestation you can do. Okay, so at, at the time the, the um, identity request is made, the information from the node attestation is also available? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so if I were to like tag the virtual machine with my IAS in a certain way that says, hey. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we can chat in more details, like depending on what, what you're trying to okay, do. Okay, awesome. Like a different you. ways. Yeah. On, uh, on yeah. my right uh, side. Yes, I guess this is a implementation question. Do you have to have like one agent per uh, VM if you have like a group of VMs running in the same network? Or I guess uh, extending this, this question, could you possibly leverage other already run, running agents to get the same data you need, like uh, for example the MDB series? Um, yeah. So the the um, answer there is that um, if you want to do attestation using Linux, you're going to need like one agent per uh, node because the attestation is going to be done like on the kernel. Um, so otherwise, you would have to figure out like how your agent is going to talk to um, the kernel of the workload that it's running in. And the other part of that too is that um, for the workload API, um, as it's defined in the Spiffy spec, like you connect to it over a Unix domain socket. And so that requires that um, both the agent and the workload uh, are running in the same node. Got it. Thank you. Next question. So in your talk, you mentioned attributes and being able to think about mapping that into construct an ID that makes sense for you. Can you, and, and you also mentioned how Kubernetes has kind of more structure in it than say Linux does, can you add structure and how much structure can you add? What makes sense and where does it start to break down? Even in, in terms of this beefy ID. Right, uh, like obviously mm -hmm. you wouldn't want to create, you know, 8,000 nested levels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. No, that's great. Do, do you wanna, I can, I can answer it. I, I have, I have, because like Nadine already referenced it. We have a blog post that's like, I think it's like very broad topic to kind of cover in the, uh, in a quick answer. It's kind of many problems in software domains kind of it depends what you're trying to do and what information you need to have so you're trying to have kind of the 
enough information for other systems to use, like an authorization system, for, for, for instance. But yeah, you can structure it in, in the way that works for your use cases. Okay. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, there is not like, there is not like do this or do that. Some systems like pretty, I would say, uh, strict like, Istio has like, hey, this is the only format that you can use of a SPIFI ID, so it will work as like an Istio service mesh. But SPIFI itself is like very open-ended in the way, like how do you construct the, how you construct it. So uh, to be kind of more flexible. Hi, awesome talk. Um, Thank you. Thanks. One thing I'm just curious about is, is a spiffy ID to a workload one-to-one, -one, or could you overlay like a group of workloads with a spiffy ID and then have individual spiffy IDs on top of that for, so maybe in, you want a group of things to have some shared permissions, but then individual mm -hmm. members of the group to have specific permissions? You're asking like if you could have more than one spiffy ID for a workload? Yeah. Okay. Interesting. I've never seen you, that. But. You shouldn't. So okay. you should have like one per workload. Uh, so in the in this sense, it's very different. I think the best analogy here would be like, hey, you use OS or use a single sign-on, right? So it's like when you go in through the system and then you use it on like in a federated ses settings for authentication. It's kind of your you as a human has like a one account with Google and then you use it for like a federated with different systems. So like this is probably the best analogy to think about it. Whether an opposite can be true in case of you have like few workloads that get the same SPIFI ID. Uh, I think it's like as Nadine showed, it, it depends, right? So you can have, it depends on the boundaries, especially like in a Linux environment, or it, it depends on what you care. You, like in Kubernetes, you can run multiple pods under the namespace, and maybe namespace granularity is what you care about. In a Linux, it could be run multiple, I don't know, uh, processes under a user, and the user like granularity is something that you, you care about in terms of boundaries. So that's how I can map it. Um, I think it's increasing. I guess we get we get over time. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much, folks, for for coming in and all awesome questions. The only kind of uh, ask I have is to if you have any feedback, please provide it. And another one, so it's the last talk of the day. Uh, let's do a quick selfie. <laughs> all right. Say hi. Hi. Hey. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming.